<clears throat> Hello everybody and welcome to our today's partner webinar, which we will do together with Absence this time. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Daniel Kessner, the CTO of Absinthe. Hello, Daniel. Hello, and welcome to this presentation. I will be accompanied by my colleague, Mr. Ingo Nicholas, Field Application Engineer at Vector Informatic. Hello, Ingo. Hello, Winnie. Hello, Daniel. Hello, everyone. Yes, last, my, last but least, my name is Winfried Schröder, and I will lead you through this webinar today. Let's have a quick look at our agenda for the next hour. I will give you a short introduction and an overview of Vector and our software test solutions. Afterwards, Daniel and Kester in his talk will explain how to avoid safety problems and security gaps in safety critical systems. He will also introduce us the solutions of Absent. No webinar without a short presentation of Vectorcast. Ingo will introduce you to the integration of Rule Checker and S3 from Absent and Vectorcast from Vector. At the end of this webinar, we are available to answer your questions. Please send your questions via the Q&A window to the moderators. A few words about Vector Informatic. Vector has founded more than 30 years ago in Stuttgart. Today we have more than 2,800 employees and offices in many countries in Europe, Asia, and North and South America. As you can see in the graphic, the first version of Vectorcast was launched, launched in 1992. Vectorcast initially supported ADA as a programming language since it was used exclusively for testing safety critical embedded software in aviation. In the following years, in 2000 and 2003, um, the support of C and C++ followed. <clears throat> in the recent years, Vectorcast was established in many other industries besides aerospace. The background is the standards and duties of the functional safety that have found their way into all industries today. Since Vectorcast was used from day one to the safety critical embedded systems with the highest criticality in the avionics, it is also a perfect fit for the automotive industry with the ISO 26262, the medical industry with the IC 62304 or FDA requirements, the IC 1548 in the automation industry and Cenelec Railway. <clears throat> Vectorcast is a test solution for all phases of software testing, from low-level software tests to the complete system test. Testing can be performed natively on a PC, on a simulator, or on the real target hardware. The Vectorcast products are located at the button and the right side of the V model where the test takes place. On the left side, you can see that Vectorcast is integrated with other tools you probably have already in your development environment. Vectorcast supports the correct, complete, and continuous approach of software testing. Code correctness and a full tested code, fully tested code are the basis of safety critical software. As we all know, testing should be done early in the design process and as often as possible. Vectorcast supports this with automation, dashboards, and integration with other tools. Not only in the development of safety critical software, it is extremely important to know what the test process currently looks like and how it can be improved. It will help you to reduce the time it takes to test, to increase the frequency of test runs, to increase the quality of the software by enabling any developer to test this code changes immediately after the code change at any time, and to maximize the level of automation for software testing. Vectorcast has features that optimize all these areas. Well, that was my short introduction. 
Daniel is already in the starting blocks and will now show us his presentation how to avoid safety problems and security gaps in safety critical systems. All right. Thank you, Winnie, and uh, welcome everybody to the second part of the presentation. Let me share my screen first. All right. All right, so you should see my screen now. I will start with a, with a slide presentation, which uh, gives an overview of static analysis approaches to look at safety and security problems in the code. And then I will give a demo of our code level analyzers, rule checker industry. So let's just jump right in. Okay, so first, a brief overview of the company Absint. Um, Absint provides development tools for embedded systems with a clear focus on safety critical and also security relevant software. The company was founded a bit more than 20 years ago from, as a spin-off from Saarland University in Germany. It's sit in a private property by the founders. We have currently a bit more than 40 employees. Our customers come from more than 40 countries all over the world, and the target industries are anything where safety or security critical software is applied. So that's aerospace, of course, automotive, railway, energy, nuclear power, wind energy, medical technology, and so on. Right, our products are depicted on the next slide if I manage to advance it. Oh, yes. Well, um, so we have a couple of different tools. The first three, every time profile and time weaver and real time systems. I want to show bounds on the worst case of a huge time on some time particular software. The next tool, analyzer, computes safe bounds on the stack usage. So the idea is to prove the app's stack overflows. Then we have a formally very optimizing C compiler, where you basically have a guarantee that the compiler does not generate wrong code for your software. And then we have some analyzers which work at the C code level, that's R3 and Rootshaker, which are the topic of today's presentation. All right, so um, when looking at some code, there are some, of course, you can uh, you can write code in different ways, and there may be different perspectives on what a um, beautiful piece of code looks like. So typically you have the good, uh, the bad, and maybe the ugly, and um, that's to some degree a matter of perception. But it becomes problematic when you run into some code which contains defects or which is very prone to defects. So here I have shown a very small piece of code. And when you look at it, uh, then you will see very quickly some places which look fishy and which certainly are not okay. But if you really want to find all of these places, well, you have to be pretty well informed and uh, you have to have a good day because actually there is a lot of issues here. So there are 41 rule violations of Ms. Rassi in this code and you have uh, a bunch of real serious issues like, for example, dangling pointer accesses, um, buffer overflows by array index out of bounds accesses, <clears throat> and some more issues which might make the code behave in a wrong way. So, of course, that's the topic of automatic static analysis to find and report such issues so that you can clean up these code level problems and have some high quality code. All right. The general background is functional safety. So when you look at some functional safety norm, which is around like the 178 b or C from avionics, ISO 262622 from automotive, uh, 51 to 8, Yen Senelec railway, or the IEC 61508 for general electric electronic systems. Of course, all of them aim to ensure the functional safety of the system and of the software. And first, whenever you look at these standards, you can basically distinguish two big building blocks for this. The first one is that you have to demonstrate the functional correctness of the code, which means that you have your 
requirements the software should fulfill. And then, of course, you have to demonstrate that the, that the software really satisfies these requirements. And for that, you can do automatic testing, maybe model-based testing. So that's what you can use uh, Vectorcast, for example, for. Then the second block is that you have to think about some safety-relevant quality requirements, traditionally termed non-functional requirements. Well, and what's that? So first, the software should not crash because of runtime errors like division by zero, invalid pointer accesses like buffer overflows or null pointer accesses, area out of bounds accesses. Then that's the area of resource usage. If you have a real time system, well, the system should react in time and the software also should not crash with a stack overflow. Then if you have multi-threaded execution, you do not want to have one thread destroy data of another thread. So when you look at the safety norms, they talk about robustness, freedom of interference, corruption of content. So wording may be different, but it's all the same issues here. Um, well, the terminology non-functional, um, let's say is a traditional term. So at the beginning, these requirements were rather implicit, so you expected the software not to crash. And then there are also, uh, the real reason I guess is uh, that they do not apply to one specific single function in the system. It's something rather general which applies to uh, all of the components of the system. Well, the problem is that with this, uh, it's very hard to do focused testing. You cannot write a specific test case, please trigger the maximum stack usage, and it's not feasible to, to, to test the software for every possible combination of input values, um, uh, control flow paths whatsoever. So a, met a method which, which very well works for this is static analysis, um, which can be done in different flavors and the formal technique, which is used uh, for sound static analysis, is based on the formal method called abstract interpretation. And uh, of course, that will be the topic of today. The interesting thing is that these guys here, runtime errors and uh, corruption of content, freedom of interference is not only relevant for, 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 sorry, for functional safety, but also for cybersecurity reasons. And uh, well, to have a bit more insight into this, uh, let's have a look at the heartbleed bug. So that was a security bug in OpenSSL from a couple of years ago, which went uh, through all the media and all the world. So um, it, it really was some, some, some costly issue. Uh, estimates are above half a million dollars. Millions of people were affected. And uh, the effect was that, well, confidential data like passwords, social insurance, uh, ins insurance numbers, patient records, and so on were leaked. And uh, the relevant piece of code is shown here, a bit simplified. So essentially, you had the heartbeat function which takes an input buffer and a length parameter. And then what it does is it allocates this length amount of bytes to a temporary buffer, my buffer, and then copies um, the input buffer to this temporary buffer. Well, from the effect, clearly, this was a security bug. When, when you look at it and think this would happen in a safety critical system, well, actually, the problems here are all safety problems because they could also cause the system to malfunction all by itself. Why? So let's have a look at this. So first of all, well, you're taking this input length parameter without any check for plausibility and use it to allocate this number of bytes. So this couldn't be an arbitrarily high number, it, so which means that you could run into a constraint violation here. Then, well, in a well. This was not a safety critical system, but in a safety critical system, you should also consider using uh, uh, standard library allocation functions like malloc. Um, then this buffer is allocated and then just used here, but the allocation might fail. So actually you might have a null pointer access here, which could crash the system. And then of course, there is no relation between input length and the true length of this buffer. And there is also no check. So that means, and that was also the vulnerability here, um, you could supply a length parameter which is much too big and then you run 
out of this buffer when reading the data, and this is what happened. So when you supply, let's say, uh, 64K as length parameter and the buffer of length 1K uh, bytes, well, then you can just read 63 kilobytes from memory, and as it happened, uh, it contained all the interesting data. So that shows that there is a clear relation between safety and security problems, and at the, hard, uh, at the, at the, at the code level, they're actually very closely related. And a bit more precisely, if you look at the top list of most exploited security vulnerabilities, you will see that uh, many of them are due to undefined or unspecified behaviors of the programming language, like buffer overflows, embedded pointer accesses, uninitialized memory accesses, data races, and so on. And when you use these to attack the code, then you can do a lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, you can run denial of service attacks with this. You can do code injection attacks where you basically ta take over the entire software. Uh, or, of course, like in the Heartbleed case, um, you can have a confidentiality breach. The interesting thing is um, if you're in a safety critical context, context uh, you can find these code defects with static analysis and if the static analysis is sound then you you can even show their upsets so that you do not have these kinds of defects in the code and then when you really want to uh, to, to show that uh, well that the system is safe in a uh, or <laughs> in a security sense <laughs> so that the system is secure um, you also have to look beyond runtime errors um, there are certain coding guidelines uh, you can take into account. You have to do data and control flow analysis, general, and maybe also tailored analysis like taint analysis, where you try to assess uh, the impact of data corruption. Where can the corrupted data flow? So this would be data safety or impact analysis. And then you can also look at side channel attacks, uh, like for example, detecting some kinds of spectral vulnerabilities. All right, so let's have a look at static analysis. Uh, well, in general, static analysis just means that you have some method here which computes some information about the program without actually executing the program under analysis. And then, depending on the analysis depth, you can distinguish different categories of static analysis. So the simplest thing you can do is uh, just work on the syntax. And this is enough for um, for a big part of coding guideline checking, uh, because, for example, if you look at MISRA, then a big part of the rules are just formulated on the syntax, on purpose, because it gives some easily to check, easily to uh, easy to to obey uh, uh, guidelines for for writing the codes. But when you w want to ask the question whether there is an error in the program, then you have to look at the semantics. And the problem is that uh, that this is an undecidable problem. So if you want, so that means that in, in general you cannot give an exact yes or no answer. So what happens when you do such a tool-based analysis is that you can have false positives, which is essentially a false alarm. So the analyzer says, "Ooh, this this doesn't look good in the code, this piece of code," but actually it's fine. So that's a false alarm. And uh, even worse, well, it can happen that uh, the analyzer, well, just misses a defect. So it says, okay, this is fine, I don't detect anything, but there is a true defect in the code. Okay, and then there are two uh, in, in the area of semantics-based analyzers. There are two categories, the unsound ones, bug finders, where you can have false positives and false negatives. And then there are the sound analyzers, which are based on the formal method of abstract interpretation. So here, you can still have false positives, but it, uh, it can be proven that there will be no false negatives. So that means that from the class of defects the analyzer targets, no defect will be missed. This is shown here with an example. So if you have this here, A by zero, well, it's clear, then uh, you have a division by zero. This can be detected syntactically. Here in this expression, A by B, well, the division by zero can happen if B can happen to be zero, So which, which means that, well, now you need semantic information, whether B can be zero at this point or not. Then 
when you have an analyzer which reports an alarm on A by B, this always means that a division by zero might happen here, or maybe not. The interesting thing is when you have no alarm on A by B. So if you have a bug finder, an unsound analyzer, well, then it means the division by zero might still happen because in some circumstances, not taken into account uh, by the analyzer, B might be zero. If you have a sound analyzer, this is a proof that B can never be at uh, zero at this point here. So this is a much stronger property. Okay, so abstract interpretation, I mentioned it. This is a semantics-based formal method for program analysis. And the motivation is the complexity problem. So it's a very difficult or undecidable problem in general, reasoning about uh, such program properties. <clears throat> so in order to be able to compute some results on realistic software, um, it's essential to, to do some abstractions, to simplify. And then, of course, there's always the danger of doing it wrong. And that, in the worst case, means that you might miss a defect. And then that's just the starting point for this abstract interpretation. So the goal here is to prove the correctness of the abstractions <clears throat> so that you can show that um, it can never happen that the defect is not reported by the tool. And in order for this to be possible, you have to have a mathematically rigorous formalism. And when you uh, create the analysis in this way, <clears throat> then, sorry about that, then you can actually conduct these proofs. So essentially, uh, this is a safety argument. There might be some loss of precision, but you can show that it's always on the safe side. So this is illustrated here a bit. If the analyzer is unsound, you can have false alarms and two errors which are not detected. And this cannot happen in a sound analyzer. Um, then you do not have missed defects anymore. You can still have false alarms. Now let's have a look at the safety norms with the example of the ISO 262062. So here I'm showing some requirements. For example, here on the software architectural design, uh, the standard requires to demonstrate appropriate spatial isolation of the software components, which is one of the properties I've shown before. So one software component should not destroy or affect uh, data of another software component. Uh, this is related to the next requirement, appropriate management of shared resources. If you have shared variables between different threads, one thread must not destroy data of another thread. So this is always recommended to consider this. And in case of the um, interference on shared resources, it is even strongly recommended for all ASILs. Regarding the methodology, you can see here the methods for software unit verification. This block here is about static analysis. So in general, you can have static analysis to check coding guidelines. This is always highly recommended. You can have static analysis based on abstract interpretation. This is always uh, recommended. You can do data and control flow analysis. And uh, you could also consider this formal verification. And then, of course, you have test requirements, uh, like requirements-based test, interface test, or fault injection test, where you can use uh, testing tools like Vectorcast. Same thing for software integration verification. Again, you have uh, test methods which, with very high recommendation levels. And again, verification of control and data flow, static code analysis in general, or static code analysis with abstract interpretation, and all of them recommended or highly recommended. Now let's have a look at coding guidelines. Complying to coding guidelines is essentially, you have seen it, uh, strongly recommended for all kinds of criticality levels. <clears throat> and then you, uh, there are different widely used coding norms around, uh, like um, uh, typically perceived as safety norm, the MISRA norms, MISRA C 2004 or 2012, MISRA C++ 2008 as well. Um, and then security norms like uh, ISO C Secure or CERT C or the Common Weakness Enumeration CWE. If you look at MISRA, uh, then you can um, find some rule uh, categorization. So there are some rules which apply at the single translation unit or at uh, the entire system. Then uh, there are decidable and undecidable rules. So that's the distinction we've mentioned before. Decidable rules 
typically are at the syntactic level, so you can just check them with a syntactic analysis. And then there are some rules which are based on semantics, and that's the undecidable rules mostly. So many of these undecidable rules you can discharge with semantic analysis. An example, rule 1.3, there should be no undefined or critical unspecified behavior. Line 1, no accesses to uninitialized variables. Or 17.2, no recursive function calls. So that's semantic properties, which means that if you want to be sure that you do not have these rule violations, at the same time code defects in the code, well then you then you need to run a sound analysis because if you have an unsound method, you might miss these rule violations or code defects. Back to the distinction safety security. When you uh, look at MISRA, then you see uh, will see that uh, of these uh, C secure rules, only four of them are not addressed by the original MISRA C norm, and those have been added in the meantime. On the other hand, uh, with third C, they contain rules like do not read uninitialized memory, do not dereference null pointers, uh, there should be no overflow, no division by zero. So that's all runtime errors. Uh, due to undefined or unspecified behaviors. Same thing like in, in, in the MISRA norms. So there is a strong overlap between these safety or security perceived rule sets. All of them aim at um, a programming style which minimizes the number of code defects. Okay, so what can we do? So there is, for example, our solution for checking coding guidelines, that's a rule checker. And here, well, you can check for compliance with coding rules like MISRA C, C++, Adaptive Autos R, C++, uh, CWE cert, and so on. Um, what you also can do is to compute code metrics and then, of course, check for threshold violations of these um, code metrics. So um, that means that by applying such a coding guideline checker or by computing the code metrics, the aim is to improve the code quality. So in the end, you come to a high code quality, which reduces the risk of programming errors, reduces the risk of security vulnerabilities. And the focus of rule checker really is to, to do this with the least possible human effort. So the analysis is very fast, the, the setup effort is minimal. Then what's also important is that, is that the full results are available in open formats like XML, so you can do some automatic processing on the analysis results. Um, it's possible to efficiently explore the results and to run all of it automatically in batch mode execution. And also to integrate it with other development tools, which is what we are also showing in this webinar. And then rule checker can be coupled with Astre, which is a sound analyzer. So here then um, you can have zero false negatives and a very low false positives rates on the semantic rules. So Astre now is a sound static analyzer which detects all of the runtime errors due to unspecified undefined behaviors at the programming language level um, and does this with a high precision. So usual suspects, error index out of bounds, division by zero, all kinds of invalid pointer dereferences, uninitialized variables. And then also concurrency defects like data races, lock and lock problems or deadlocks. It also contains a module for taint analysis. Uh, it can detect spectral vulnerabilities. And of course, uh, checking the coding guidelines is part also of the S3 analyzer. What's important is, well, um, the analyzer uh, will not miss any potential defects, but then it's also important to keep the false alarm rate low. And therefore, the analysis core of us is very powerful. There are lots of different abstract domains. And then you can also locally tune the precision of the analyzer. So you can really uh, focus uh, the available computation resources on, on the software characteristics and get to the best possible precision. And then, uh, of course, it's also important to give detailed feedback about uh, the analyzer results, which helps you review the findings. One word to data and control flow analysis. So in control flow analysis, you look at the calling relationships between functions, the call graph, and also whether which functions can be called by which thread. Then in data flow analysis, it's the global static variables with their accesses, which are most interesting and, uh, well, what are the locations where they are accessed, the functions, the processes, 
Is it a read or write access? And are the accesses thread local, or maybe is it the variable shared, and possibly shares and subject to a data race? And the important thing is that uh, with soundness, you can be sure that no data or control flow will be missed, because then the analysis is aware, is aware of all data pointers, function pointers, the task interference, and so on. Okay, to, to summarize this, in general, um, running the sound analysis is very important for safety and for cybersecurity because then you really can prove the absence of critical code defects. And if you have shown that there are no runtime errors in the code, this is already, let's say, a pretty good starting point. Um, so essentially, this means that you can reduce the risk of failures in the field. Then high analysis speed, low false alarm rate means that you can do the analysis with low human effort. And then the analysis um, are very powerful. So they report uh, the runtime errors, uh, data races, deadlocks. Um, in case uh, you're using R in Cruzic or Autosaf system, the configuration can be extracted from uh, uh, the operating system configuration in case of OSEC Autosar. So uh, the analysis is, is aware of the operating system behavior. Then you have a taint analysis, so you, you can do more advanced cybersecurity analysis. The rule check is included, so you can check for the coding guidelines. And of course, there is support for fully automatic execution and integration in other tool landscapes. So in general, um, in, in safety critical systems, it's clear you have to demonstrate the absence of safety defects and also security becomes more and more important due to um, uh, more pervasive uh, communication requirements between uh, safety critical systems. For example, in the context of autonomous systems. And then uh, static analysis is an essential building block for demonstrating safety and security. It's highly recommended by all safety norms. So checking coding compliance uh, or co compliance to coding guidelines is more or less mandatory. Um, similar computing code metrics and also doing runtime error analysis by sound static analysis is very important. So here you can show the absence of critical code defects, like division by zero buffer overflows and so on. And if you think in terms of fault, uh, fail operational systems, fault tolerance, it means that you can you can provide fault avoidance with respect to these programming language level defects. And um, last point is that this can be easily automated and also fully integrated. And that's what we are going to show later in the demo. Okay, so I'm through with the slides now, which means that, that now I will switch to the tools. So first of all, so I'm opening the, uh, the graphical user interface for Astray or Old Checker. And first of all, I will set up a very quick um, example for rule checking. So the code excerpt I've shown on the initial slides. So I've started the new project with it. I want to open um, an example project checking. Uh, so then I have to select some source files. Uh, like, for example, uh, here. Um, then I can select some uh, coding guideline, for example, let's say uh, MISRA 2012, and um, also some metric rules. And then I'm already done. And I can run the analysis. Right. So analysis is running, and then you will see the results. So this here is a brief overview. So here we would see uh, whether there are pass errors or other problems. Uh, this is the number of uh, checks which have failed. <clears throat> and in general, each check uh, contributes to demonstrate some, some rule violation. So this is the rule violation overview. Um, here you see the breakdown by rule uh, uh, chapter and individual rule and the number of alarms for each of these rules. You can also navigate in the pie chart if you like. So here you quickly see what <coughs> the most predominant rule violations are. So let's, for example, uh, look into this. And um, when I do a double click here, then I will see the individual uh, violations of a given rule. Like in this case, well, I have 
it's, it's, it's a MISOC rule 8.7. Um, if I'm using a variable only in a single translation unit, then I should declare it static. So this is essentially what this rule says. Okay, and then uh, if I'm in the classical uh, role of a tester or verifier, then, well, um, I may not be directly able to change the code, so I can comment this, do a classification. Well, this is a justified finding um, and uh, leave a comment. Um, I can also do this for uh, the next alarm. I could uh, also categorize this as well. This is justified, uh, but I don't care. Um, or possibly in this case, let's say, oh, well, I deem this is a false alarm. So both cases could be due to MISRA deviations. Um, and uh, like this, I can review the findings. And then there are several views here. Uh, so, like for example, here you would see, okay, in total you have this number of finding, findings, and uh, this gives you an overview of the review process, how many alarms you have investigated, how many you have categorized as true, um, uh, false, and so on. Okay, so for some other, uh, well, okay, now let's uh, set up the same project now with the semantic analysis of Astrea. And, and, Starting this now, so um, then I can select the source files again. Okay, and uh, now I can uh, select, for example, the ABI for my target processor. Like, uh, for example, let's select the tricore. Um, can set some options like whether I want to assume static and global variables to be automatically initialized to zero. Um, then I could activate the coding guideline checks, which I leave out at this point. Uh, uh, so we have better overview of the semantic findings. Then I can click on finish. And then the analysis has been set up and I can run it. Okay, so in this case, um, Astre wants to know, so this is an Astre analysis we are doing right now. And uh, for an Astre analysis, you need an entry point. So and, and then you will analyze the behavior of the software with respect to this entry point. I did not specify this. So here the tools uh, give me some suggestions. For example, there is a function which is, uh, for which there is no call. Uh, for, for example, the recess function, there is one call in the code. So it makes sense to use this here as my analysis entry. Mm. Then I can run the analysis and have the result. So. In this case, uh, we can see, okay, now there's different kinds of defects. So here I see invalid usage of pointers and arrays, for example, like uh, an array index out of bounds access here. So this is the example we have seen um, in the code before. Okay. So, um, yes, then what you also have is an overview of the reachability, whether you have some unreachable code and the breakdown of the um, uh, of the findings per file. So in this case, I've only put one source file in, which is kind of boring. So um, I'll just add um, another example where we have some more interesting views. I can run the analysis again. Okay, so my laptop seems to be a bit tired. Now all data has been there, so the analysis runs and we see the results. So in that case, we can see, okay, there is an overview per file. So we can see, okay, this is the file with the biggest number of defects. Then we have the reachability information, how much uh, reachable or unreachable code we have here. And we also have the data flow information, uh, like for example, where do we have accesses to variables, read the right accesses, in which function, in which process, uh, if, is there a data race on the variable, is the variable shared, and so on. So this is the information we see here. There is also a different uh, view for this, also a control flow view, the caller-callee relations in the program.
The call graph is also extracted, so here I can uh, show this is the call graph of the function or of the program which functions can call which other functions. And uh, so I get a, get a pretty good overview of the um, of what's happening inside the software. Now, if I want to investigate some finding, like for example, um, let's just pick out the division by zero here in this place. So we can see, okay, here we have a division by zero, which is reported in this division here. And well, I run into this, uh, if I'm calling the procedure seven function and do this from this place in the code, which is contained in a loop. Well, this loop, it's contained in another loop, this one. Uh, it's in a function procedure zero. This is the call site. So you can see if you have such a finding, um, then you can, like in a debugger, walk up the call stack and see how you ran into this particular issue. And in this case, the analyzer also says, well, whenever you uh, get into this place, you will definitely run into this uh, code defect. So you don't have a definite runtime error here. Okay, so this is the manual exploration of the results. And then, of course, it's possible to generate some report files. If you want to do some automatic processing of the results, then, well, you can generate an XML report, which is very well suited for automatic uh, processing. Or you can uh, generate some human-readable uh, reports, like, for example, alarm by category. Um, so let's just check the two of them. I can generate this and then when, for example, I open the XML report, we can see, well, it's a layouted report. Here we have some top level information about the analysis, how many code places with problems, how many reached code, what's the analysis configuration, and then, of course, uh, my findings. And if I had entered a classification or a comment, then we would also see this here. Okay. So that's uh, essentially the um, uh, the overview of how the tool operates. And uh, with this, I think I will give back to Ingo for the part of the integration. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. So this was all about static code analyze, and now I will uh, show a little bit more about dynamic um, testing, dynamic code analyze, like for example, um, code coverage analysis, um, and doing functional tests by executing the code. So as I said, while uh, um, Daniel is all looking at the code or uh, root checker in us three, is all looking at the code without executing. Um, Vectorcast is meant to dynamically execute the code, and this is recommended by safety standards, and this is where Vectorcast comes from. It is recommended to start with a um, functional unit test. Um, unit test means um, test a very small part of the software, like one file or one function, and then from that put multiple files together, maybe test a subcomponent, which is then called um, software software integration level testing, uh, and then in higher levels of testing um, with Vectorcast, we can help in measuring code coverage. And this is an example of a test project. It's quite small projects. We just have three unit test environments, uh, which indicates that we have not more than three files. So it's not a real life um, example, but each of these uh, C files is tested independent from the rest of the software then we have a software software integration test environment <clears throat> where we have test some um, C files in combination, uh, the functionality implemented in multiple C files, and we have a system level test where we can measure code coverage. The nice thing about this testing project is that we have a single point of configuration where we can say this is our compiler, these are the include paths, these are the uh, compile defines used. We can also do a full or a incremental rebuild that means we we look at so if we do the incremental rebuild we we check whether source code changed or whether test cases changed and then we can incrementally just 
uh, re redo the work that needs to be done, like if source code changed, uh, we would rebuild the test environments that are affected by the source code change, and then we see which test cases are affected by the source code change, and then rerun those test cases. Another advantage of this uh, testing project, where we have all dynamic <coughs> testing activities in, in one tool, is that we can look at, the, uh, at some metrics, for example, at some overall metrics, um, like code coverage summary, um, that means we see which C files are tested in, in all these um, different test environments. We, we can sort by a function, for example, and see which functions are tested. We can also um, sort by cyclomatic uh, complexity. That means see which are the most complex, uh, the, the most complicated functions in, in the code and how well are they tested. What is the least coverage that we achieved on, on different files or different functions? Um, and also from here, we, we can jump into a C file and look at the overall coverage. And for example, we see here um, that multiple test environments executed um, this function or executed this line in the function, whereas um, other uh, lines in the code may only be executed by uh, or used by, by one of these test environments. So where do these test environments come from? And I will show this on an example of a unit test environment. We can start here um, inside a compiler node and create a new um, unit test environment. And then we already have the configuration for this unit test environment. We already know what the compiler is and the include paths and compile defines. But just to give you a brief overview of the supported compilers by Vectorcast, you see that we have uh, the who is who of cross compilers um, that you can configure in Vectorcast and then to build the unit test executable, we use your compiler to make sure that you get a binary that is able to execute on your specific target and also that the, compile, uh, the, the code is compiled um, in the same way as it will be shipped to your customer so that you test the thing as it will be running on your um, product. Okay, we need to specify a name. Uh, which can be anything, and then we need to tell Vectorcast what are the files that we want to test. It can be just a single file um, where um, you do um, software unit test, test sing single functions, um, and all dependent functions that are called by the unit under test but implemented outside of the unit under test will then be automatically stopped by Vectorcast. Or you can say you want to do a software software integration level test, add additional files, um, and then test a subcomponent against the interfaces. Now for this um, very quick introduction, I want to show how to do a unit test. So we can create a unit test for this one single file, manager.c. And while we wait for the results, feel free to add questions in the Q&A panel. If you have any questions to Daniel or questions to me in the end of, uh, let's say in about eight minutes, uh, you will have a chance uh, or we will have a chance to answer your questions. So um, please um, enter them to the Q&A panel. So in the meanwhile, the unit test environment was created. We see the name, we see the C file under test and we see multiple functions that are implemented inside that C file. Now, for the purpose of testing, we can create a, simil, a simple test case. A test case is a call to a function, and we see the interface of the function, we see the parameters, um, and we also have access to global variables um, that are um, defined in that C file. So you, for the test, you could add values to the global variables, we can tell um, that we want to run a test case where we call the function under test with specific parameters. You see that we analyze the source code, we analyze the types, and we know that those are um, unsigned shorts or there is a struct. And then if there is a struct, you can even, or when there are enumerations, you can even choose from a, a drop down what you want to call the function with. So, Calling a function with input values is interesting, but the more interesting part is what are the expected output values. And those are usually defined in low level requirements. And that's why we have um, import capabilities. We can import requirements from external requirements management tools, like for example, I don't know, Polarian, um, PDC Integrity, CodeBeamer, 
uh, or even um, Word or Excel. So um, here I have a list of requirements that were imported, uh, in this case, from a CSV file. And then just by double clicking, we can add or we can link requirements to test cases. And then when you hover over a requirement, you see what the requirement says. So in this case, we see that chicken would um, expect to cost 10 euros. And then you can use these um, values from the requirements to fill the um, expected data. Now uh, we can enter expected return values and we can also tell the stops that Vectorcast created to um, check things. Um, for example, we can tell the stop to verify that it is called with an appropriate table number. In this case, we'd expect that the function under test place order will call the stop with parameter table of value one. And we can also tell the stop to return specific things, like for example, the number of party uh, is zero, and then we have a name for the weight person. So like this, we can specify input values and we can specify expected values. And um, stop values, by the way, can be um, specified per test case. So in another test case, we may want to let the stop return different things. And now we can dynamically execute the code and see whether by running the code, we get the output that we expected, return values that we expected and stops being called as we expected. So we see um, that the result is a pass. We see that we called the place order function and in the end we return from the place order function and everything is fine. Now it's easy to duplicate test cases, get an identical copy and then um, change, for example, one parameter from chicken to steak and rerun. And then we can look at code coverage that we got from the dynamic execution. Now, in this case, we only see the code coverage that we achieved on the source code in this test environment, not overall in all our test projects. But here we see um, which test case executed which line. And also, by the way, this is showing <clears throat> the code coverage on the pre-processed code. Um, so here we see we, we have some missing coverage um, in this um, switch statement. For example, the no entry case was not executed or steak and chicken was executed. And one of the features that I wanted to show um, today, so <clears throat> the first thing I have to show is the um, integration to AppSynth before I forget it. And we can, um, we can call the rule checker from AppSynth um, from the static analyze um, integration that we built. And for AppSynth, a lovely colleague of mine wrote a Python script um, that feeds um, the um, input ASCII file that AppSynth uses to analyze the code. And then um, AppSynth creates an XML file and we can read the XML output and then understand it and, and show the results inside of Vectorcast. Um, so we can show, for example, that we have some um, uh, alarms uh, from AppSynth. And when you take the different messages, then we jump to the source code where um, the, the issue is. And we also show a message um, that's also part of the XML file. We show a message um, explaining what the specific um, issue is at this place. Now, finally, the last thing I wanted to show is that we have an option to do uh, something like a fault injection. If you want to get more code coverage or if you want to execute dynamically more code, test the um, else cases in your source code, maybe not, not only in, system, in, in um, unit level testing, but in system testing, uh, we support a code injection into specific uh, lines of your code where, wherever you like. You, you can tell Vectorcast, um, at this place, I would like to add code. And the code could, for example, be that we change um, the switch parameter, the thing that is switched over, um, to, for example, get into a um, default case or in a not existent default case. So like this, you can inject code. Um, and this code is then um, injected into your source code and executed when you run different um, test cases. Those injected uh, pro points, um, for them we have a list. Um, the list, um, so of course it needs to be compiled and, and linked to the executable. And the pro point listing has an ID and it tells you in which module, in which function, in which line, what is the context and what code should be entered. 
and this um, pro point listing has an ID and the ID allows you to activate or deactivate pro points from the command line interface. So this was pretty much everything I wanted to show you from dynamic testing, dynamic software testing. So together with static code analyze, we fulfill the testing requirements um, that are in um, safety um, standards, required by safety standards. And now we are happy to answer questions. I pass over to Winnie, I guess. Winnie, please. Yes, thank you, Ingo, for your presentation. As Ingo said, it's now time for the Q&A session. Please feel free to ask your questions at any time during this webinar. Um, Daniel, I want to give you the chance to answer your questions. Did you get? Yes, so there were some questions about concurrent analysis, so maybe you could give me the presentation rights and then I would quickly show an example for this because that was not contained in my previous demo. So, <clears throat> this here would be an example where uh, we want to set up an analysis on an OSEX system. So basically, uh, we read the operating system configuration from the OIL file, so we automatically know what the tasks are in the system, what the priorities are, and what resources have been declared. And then, of course, we need to, um, to have the, the, the sources uh, in the uh, in the configuration of the system, and then I can just I can just run the analysis. So I will do this, and um, okay. So while it's running, maybe we can have a brief look at the source file. So here you can see well, this is the the source code um, <clears throat> contained in the application code. So you have your your task functions declared with the appropriate macros, uh, you have a startup hook and so on, and how these tasks are invoked, uh, what the priorities is and so on, so this is automatically extracted from the OIL file. So you can see here uh, at the top level, we have the information that there is a data race, and then we can go to the data flow view and see, okay, this is the information we have uh, of the variables in the program, there are some shared variables, and then we have a variable on which there is a data race, this is variable G. We can see, okay, there are two processes interfering on it, uh, it's task one and task two, and we also see which, um, which of these uh, processes is doing which access from which function. And then we have uh, detailed information on precisely which accesses are affected from the given data race, so you can, we can see here, okay, when we access this global variable here in this case, well, then <clears throat> actually we have a read-read or a read-write data race in this place. And the reason for this interference is here that the, uh, that, uh, the process synchronization is broken. So in OSEC you can uh, declare a log variable with get resource and free it with release resource. Here yeah, um, the critical section was not there, which is the reason for this, uh, for this interference on this variable. So if I fix this and rerun the analysis, then we can see that Astri can show, okay, fine. There are really no, um, no runtime errors, no data races anymore in this code. So this is more or less how it looks like. And if you have an AutoZAR set up, then the configuration can be extracted from an RxML file. So, okay, so that's, uh, so much for, let's say, the concurrent analysis. Then um, I'm switching back to Vinny again. Um, next analysis was whether uh, some alarms reported by the tool can be ignored in further development. Okay, so in general, there are, well, different, uh, different kinds of alarm you can have. So when you check coding guidelines, for example, like MISRA, then maybe um, you want to disregard certain rules, maybe always, then you can just um, not activate a given rule from this rule set, or just under specific circumstances, in which case you would have to, to formulate a deviation. So this is something you could, um, uh, use in the classification and in the comment for the given finding, and then uh, in, for the rest uh, of the of the process, you can ignore this finding. 
And also with runtime errors, there are different degrees of criticality. So if we say, okay, this is a critical runtime error, like a buffer overflow, which is, which is guaranteed to happen in a given context, then of course this is the most uh, severe thing you can have. You should definitely investigate this. And uh, if it's, uh, let's say, for example, an overflow, well, then um, at least we will take into account all potential effects of this overflow. So it, yes, uh, still the computation of the program could be wrong, functionally wrong if you run into unexpected overflows, but if for due to this overflow you would run into a buffer overflow again later, this would be something which is reported by Astre then. So in, in that sense, that, that's, uh, that's less critical. So basically there is a certain ordering uh, in the findings uh, among this criticality, so you can proceed in order uh, to, to walk through the findings. And of course, if you can identify some of, of the alarms reported by the tool to be a false alarm, then of course you can also do the corresponding classification and then ignore it from then on. Um, then there was a question whether Astre does automatic regression testing. So I think uh, Astre does, does a purely static analysis. So you have information about all potential program execution. So basically this will assume that you can run all potential input data in all potential, uh, on all potential paths in the software and uh, will investigate this um, set of potential program behaviors. And then of course, if you want to combine this uh, with testing, this is precisely what this uh, integration with uh, Vectorcast is about. And uh, I think Ingo can, can say more about this question then later on. Okay, next question is regarding, um, regarding code coverage. So yes, Astrea will report code which is guaranteed to be unreachable. So when doing the dynamic tests, then uh, you should see that the corresponding code is not covered by the test cases. And then you can cross-reference this with the results of Astrea and say, okay, yes, well, this is expected, it's unreachable, so of course my testing does not reach this. Um, so yes. Um, and there is one more question just coming in. Uh, I think it's about vector cost as well. So. Maybe Ingo, you want to uh, address these questions? I do indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, there is a question um, about the um, coverage integration of Astre. Um, so can we integrate code coverage from Astre with the code coverage of Vectorcast in the sense of that we should dynamically test code that was not analyzed statically, which is from my point of view the other way around. Usually I would expect that static code analyze is something that is done on all the code and you would only want to test code maybe where you found a lot of potential issues. And, and this is one of the integration that, that we um, analyzed in the past. We can, for example, um, import static code analyze into Vectorcast in the sense of mark all lines as green or functions as green where the static code analyze had no concerns. That means in dynamical testing, you would not focus on code that looks proper from the static code analyze. You would focus on the red lines, on the lines where the static code analyze had some complaints or some potential um, risks, uh, which would reduce the amount of work you would have to spend in dynamic testing. So this, this is something that we investigated and this would, I would think, be possible with uh, root checker also. And then there is a question or uh, multiple questions on, on different requirements management systems and, and whether or not they um, integrate with Vectorcast and how that works. So of course it, it depends on the requirements management system that you're using. I'm not sure whether I have a complete list of requirements management systems that we um, support, um, but we do support Polarion. Um, DOS, DOS Next Generation, um, PTC Integrity, JAMA, Siemens Team Center, uh, Word, Excel, um, CSV, and uh, maybe more. <laughs> so the, the uh, integration is realized using Python scripts. So even if the integration would not be available, you could write your own scripts, of course, with our help. 
Um, and the integrations are usually in a way that you don't need to manually do anything. Um, there is a specific question on Polarian, and this integration I know very well. And this integration uses the web service of Polarian to access work items directly, and then you can import work items, for example, of type requirements or software requirements, and then you automatically pull everything into the tool, and you have your ID and your title and your description, and you can link to um, test cases, and we can also export the test cases and the results and the links to the requirements back to Polarian. If you're interested, just let us know. And then there is a final question regarding Vectorcast and how we can um, do a pill test or integrate with a debugger. Well, the, the main uh, technical knowledge you need to, to have to understand how this works is um, Vectorcast um, automatically builds a framework around the code under test in the uh, programming language used. So we, we built a C framework around the, the C code under test or C++ around the C++ code. And then we use your compiler to build a binary and your compiler knows how to build an executable for your chip. Um, then once we have a binary that can run on your chip, we can use a script or we can use the IDE um, of, of your development environment to flash the binary to the target. And then we have different other ways um, how we can get data back from the target. So this depends very much on the specific hardware, the specific uh, capabilities that, that your development environment or testing environment has. And for example, we, we can even transport code coverage um, via the CAN bus. So if you have an um, embedded test on, an, for example, an, an ECU in a car and you only have the CAN bus available, then you can run test cases with Canoo, for example, uh, and we can measure code coverage from these CANU test cases on the embedded ECU and get the coverage via the CAN bus. Just one example of a possible integration and how it is solved. Okay, that's it from my side. Back to you, Winnie. Yes, thank you, Ingo. Thank you, Daniel, for answering the questions. Um, unfortunately, it's, our time has already expired. Um, it's time to thank you, Daniel and Ingo, for your presentations. Um, we would also like to thank all attendees for your interest and so many questions you asked us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and we can welcome you again at one of our next events. We wish you all a pleasant day and thank you and goodbye. Thank you and goodbye.